so. So, so I think we might now start. And of course, we use many languages here, but we have the simultaneous interpretation, so there is no problem. So we will have, we'll have the English and the Italian and French. French, I don't know. Inna, you are there. Do you speak French or English today? Uh, today I will speak uh, English. <laughs> well, that's a part of Okay. So we have many languages, but no problem. And mm -hmm. uh, so I'm joining only today to this um, great, very important symposium on Nizami Dante. So I'm very glad to be invited and honored to be invited here. So I'm, I'm very most curious of what, what you will be saying. And um, I suppose because uh, time is uh, rather limited, <laughs> I think only what, 15 minutes for each one to, to speak and then discussion. We should now start right now. And I have taken a print of the <laughs> old fashioned uh, of the program. And um, I suppose that, the, yes, the, the theme of this uh, session is the semiotics and medievality. That is the, the very general title for all your speeches during your aspects. So um, I think we must start. And uh, the first speaker, Inna Merkulova from Paris or, or Moscow. I don't know how, how would you say so. Oh. so yeah, <laughs> yeah. In many, many places. And yeah, your title will be the space of Dante's Div divine comedy in the semiotics of Yuri Lotman, the great uh, Russian, uh, Russian Estonian, <laughs> Estonian Tartus scholar. So you are welcome. Thank you. Thank you, dear Professor Tarasti. It's a great pleasure to see you. And I'd like, first of all, to thank, uh, th thanks, uh, many thanks to uh, the organizers. Uh, thanks to Rafila Gibulaeva uh, for inviting me to this uh, so important uh, and uh, uh, topical uh, conference. I present uh, some reflections uh, in the framework of uh, this international scientific conference, cross-cultural matches, Nizami and Dante, dedicated to the 880th birthday of Nizami Ganjevi and uh, <clears throat> the 700th anniversary of Dante Alighieri. Um, and now uh, I will try to <laughs> make my presentation just a few seconds. I hope that will be okay. Is it okay now? You can see my presentation? Yes? Yes. So, <clears throat> Memorable dates and uh, uh, anniversary are themselves a semiotic phenomenon. Semiotics deals with the phenomena of meaning. It builds a general image of science and texts that make up the history of human culture. In this sense, we should understand the statement of the famous Russian philologist and semiotician Vyacheslav Sevolodovich Ivanov. The task of semiotics is to describe the semiosphere without which a new sphere is unsinkable. Semiotics should help us to navigate history. Therefore, memorable dates, anniversary of prominent personalities, writers and scientists, serve as a kind of cultural reference points. It is no coincidence that in the UNESCO system, there is a whole program of memorable dates, international dates, international decades and anniversary from a hundred years and above, aimed at promoting intercultural dialogue and tribute to the memory of outstanding personalities who contributed to the construction of human civilization. Recent examples of UNESCO anniversaries include the Congress of the French Semiotic Association, for example, on the 100th anniversary of the birth of the founder of the Paris Semiotic School, Argedar Jürgen Greimas and uh, this year the conference of, uh, uh, on the centenary of the living French philosopher and sociologist Edgar Morin. 2022, the same community awaits the centenary of the birth of the founder of the Moscow Tartus Semiotic School, Yuri, and the 60th anniversary of the first symposium on the structural study of science systems in, at the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow which became an impetus for the development of semiotics in Russia and also in the world. According to the well-known expression of Yesenin, the big is seen at a distance, and therefore the anniversaries of the great authors Nizami and Dante are a wonderful opportunity to look at their pets from the point of view of semiotic at the end of the 20th century, 
paths of evolution from semiotics of culture of Lotman to the semiotics of Pasha of Gremas and Fontani and the bodily semiotics of Marcella Castellan. Divine comedy is a symbolic space in the conception of Yuri Lotman. The image of the artist creator underlines many of Yuri Lotman's semiotic analysis. One of the striking examples is the chapter semantic intersection as a semantic explosion, inspiration of his last work, Culture and Explosion, in 1992. There is a book, uh, and there is also a translation into French that I made in France. La culture et l'explosion. Explosion et la culture in French. Culture and explosion. So, in culture and explosion, Rodman refers to the facts of Pushkin and Bloch and describes creative inspiration as a great, greatest tension, an explosion, a person out of the sphere of logic into the area of unpredictable creativity. The entire process of creativity is a kind of thing that makes the Translatable, translatable, where the inexpressible inspiration is cast into poetic words. In the book Universe of the Mind, Lotman pays special attention to the so called symbolic spaces that are built by the artist, the writer, and the poet. From the point of view of the Moscow Tato Semiotic School, Dante Alighieri could most accurately be called an architect, although he, he, he compared himself to a geometer, because the entire divine comedy is a huge architectural structure, the construction of the universe. According to Lotman, Dante's world is a huge message from its creator, a mysterious message that might, uh, that might be uh, deciphered. The world as a product of creativity is endowed with purpose and meaning about every detail of it we can ask. What does it mean? The universe, is presented as a semiotic text awaiting its decoder. Dante, the narrator, simultaneously possesses the point of view of both the creator and the person. For the space building that he construct in, constructs in his text, the top bottom axis is of particular importance. The first meaning of the up down axis is valid only within the S. Down is the center of gravity of the globe, and up is any direction from the radius to the center. The second meaning of the axis is the absolute top and bottom, as pointed out by the philosopher and mathematician Pavel Zvarensky. In the cosmic sheen of the divine comedy, space is organized into the Aristotle. The northern hemisphere is at the bottom of the earth, as less perfect and the southern hemisphere is at the top. Dante and his companion Vigil, following this scale up down, descend into the depths of the S from its surface to the center. But paradoxically, at the same time, they rise up in relation to the relation of the world axis. The paradox can be explained in the context of Dante's semiotics where a special meaning is attributed to each special category. According to Lotman, Dante's relationship between expression and content in, is devoid of the traditional conventions of semiotic systems. We are not talking about science, but about symbols in the terminology of the soul. In the terminology of Pseudotinio Dionysius, the Aurobagid, Dante's symbols really show the world of super being at the level of being. The content of the symbol, as it were, shines through in it and shines through the brighter, the closer the object or creature is to the heavenly light of truth. At the highest level of the universal hierarchy, we can directly contemplate the truth with a spiritual eye. At the lower level, it takes on the character of purely conventional science. Sinners and demons use purely conventional science, so they can lie and deceive. Righteous people, if they use conventional science, do not harm them, do not use their conventional nature for evil. In the Divine Comedy, the entire semantic architectonics of the text 
is organized around the top bottom axis. And Dante's movement in the text is always either a descent or ascent. At the same time, as Lotman notes, behind the real descent or ascent, a spiritual fall or ascension always shines through. Dante and Vigil descend into hell, and the movement signifies a descent downward. But at the same time, the descent of the heroes is also the ascent in the spiritual sense. Particular attention of Lotman semiotics in Dante's text is the non-trivial distribution of sins in terms of punishment. The author of the Divine Comedy offers his own interpretation of the severity of sins, far from church norms and everyday ideas. Medieval readers were surprised by the fact that Dante's hypocrites are placed into the sixth slot of the uh, eighth circle, and the heretics are much higher in the sixth circle. As for modern readers, we are surprised when we see modernists uh, murderers is the first ditch of cycle, uh, cycle uh, eight, and counterfeiters in the depths is the tenth slot of cycle eight. However, according to Lotman, such a, distribute, a distribution is strictly logical. If some actions falsify or violate the true connections between content and expression, then they are worse, worse than murder since they kill the truth and are the source of lies in all its inter internal uh, essence. Dante builds a special model of the world as a definite continuum. It contains individual trajectories of individual paths and destinies. After death, the soul of a person makes a certain path of the world continuum, as a result of which it is placed in a space corresponding to its moral value. Wretched souls are in blissful rest. Sinners are in eternal cyclical movement. And only Dante himself, the author and narrator, has freedom of movement, since, as Lotman notes, his upward movement includes the knowledge of all paths, both truth and false. The body and the fear of the invisible. Dante is interpreted by Marcello Castellano. Marcello Castellano is a talented mathematician of the Paris School of Cranes, and he devoted a number of works to the analysis of Dante's text. And I would like to draw special attention to one of these texts. Uh, uh, it's a Castellana speech on, at the International Semiotic Seminar in Paris, published then in the journal New Semiotic Acts. In the preface to uh, Castellana's analysis, the French semiotician Jacques Fontani notes that at the end of 20th century, a turning point occurred in European semiotics and the semiotic function was revised. The relations of expression and content are no longer considered to be relations of the order of logical presupposition. The two planes of language were combined not purely logically, but through proprioceptivity, participation in content, to feel the semiotic phenomenon of tension and to expression, to express the semiotic phenomenon of phoria. In the analysis of the divine comedy, with which Castellana proposes, the medium between expression and content within the perception is carried out not only through the body, but also within the body. And this phenomenon should be carefully studied. According to Castellana, Dante's text shows that the body is no longer just a means of unifying semiotic existence, combined with interoceptive and exteroceptive planes on the basis of which the two planes of language arise. The body itself is a place of meaningful articulations, and therefore the future of semiotic research as Castellana believes, is the topics of semiotics of the natural bodies. Uh, the first song introduces the theme of fear and its variety, horror, on which the relationship between the human and the sacred is built. In the midway of this our mortal life, I found me in a gloomy wood. According to Castellana, fear, horror, 
at the level of utterance is a maker of the recognition of the subject traveler, any of us in a, in a similar situation of entering an unknown world experiences similar feeling. The opposition between the individual and the collective, we, a mortal life, having passed away, I found myself. And other, another opposition between the space of life and the real of, of new life, life forest. Uh, our life, a groomy forest. Fear occurs a real taste. It is bitter and the forest is compared to the realm of non-life, to death. He is so bitter that death is almost sweeter. Fear appears as a certain form that allow us readers to identify ourselves with a speaking subject. This person is like us. We, like him, are afraid of the unknown. Further, we observe a gradual release from fear. According to the narrator, if someone wants to clean up, he must be below. And this is the only way to start the ascent. When moving upward, the fear of the invisible, the absence of other living beings, gives way to another fear, the fear of a specific personified danger. The latter appears in the form of animals, lion, lynx, and she-wolf. With him, he's a she-wolf. In Castellana's interpretation, the experience of the storyteller's passions plays the role of a connecting link that ensures a harmonious linear sequence of Dante's text. The point of view of bodily semiotics and semiotics of passions on Dante's text allows Castellana to come to the following conclusion. The S builds a whole system of relations with the body and the cosmos, on the basis of which the meaning of the story, la signification du récit in French, arises. And all this happens before the appearance of any form of linguistic coding. And now I will pass to my conclusion. The analysis of the divine comedy from the point of view of the semiotics of culture, Lotman, and the semiotics of passions and bodily semiotics, Grayman, Gramus and Fontani, Castellana, reveals one of the key features of the Dante's text. The author thinker with his special, special concept of God and evil, and with bodily somatic manifestations of human nature and emotions is an integrated part of the cosmos. He is aligned of the isolation of the individual, the separation of science and morality, which will, will come in the era following Dante's time. As Lotman writes, Dante, uh, Alighieri's encyclopedism of knowledge, which included almost the entire arsenal of science of his time, did not uh, uh, add up in his mind to the sum of disparate information, but formed a single integrated building, which merged into the harmonic structure of the cosmos. And it was about this author thinker that the great French poet Victor Hugo wrote in the 19th century. Crossing the road on the evening, one evening, I met a traveler. He is in a cons consular toga. He seemed to be dressed. Then he was born a lion, dreamed among the deserts. And on the gloomy night, I sent my roar from the prairie. Now I am a man. I am Dante Alighieri. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I will wait for your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ina Merkula, for this very, very exciting speech. <laughs> Indeed, very nice. And certainly this evokes many ideas and many issues. But um, uh, is it here a habit that we take uh, some questions immediately after each speech or all at the end? After, please, if possible, after, at the end of this after. panel, please. At the end only. Okay, but let me only say that it is fascinating this Lotman idea of the of the sign becoming symbol, so as a kind of a signe marque or, or, or foregrounded, and then of course the idea that the whole Dante universe is like this um, uh, <laughs> bottom-up model. It's the same like the model for um, reconstruction of ancient texts by Manuel, a funny symbol, or maybe maybe, and then Marcelo Castellana, our good friend. Fantastic that you they took his ideas. So thank you very much indeed. 
No, anyway, uh, because time is limited, we have to go um, continue, and then we may return to Inna's presentation at the end. Now, next speaker, I would like to. Uh, ah, Anna Piacella, si voglio presentare, ma forse non in italiano, forse in uh, inglese o. Oh. Uh, um, sì, un, Anna, Marita, um, Anna Rita Piazzella è Università di Roma 3, Italia, è, 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 il titolo della sua presentazione, Federico di Amore, Grazie. cosa per sé, la personificazione di amore nella vita nuova. So you are most welcome here. Grazie professore, grazie agli organizzatori di questo splendido congresso. I'm always impacted, just the connection was restored right now, sorry. In fact, in this last expression, uh, the dominance of love that is reflected in Dante's uh, poems reveals the sweetness of love. And there are various expressions like Ego Dominus Cus et Deus fortio me, or uh, well, the holy Jehovah uh, speaks of his love. Therefore, uh, we are speaking of the initial phases of love and the morality of those dedicated to it the, and the uh, relations towards them. And in fact, the um, love in Dante's interpretation is uh, something that ends up with physical death. And this is viewed as a very progressive idea for its time. And I would even say that uh, love is shown as a kind of idol. And uh, in the seventh chapter, the transformation of body, carnal transformation, um, is making human body something very relative. And in section five, the, the phenomena uh, imagined by Francesca, we can, we can trace them. Uh, so uh, she kissed me um, or with sweet words and she had frozen my heart with her attitude. So uh, with her will, uh, the relations between the will and love is clearly expressed. And in chapter one, these expressions are found and in later parts, the um, imagination and the images uh, shifted and it becomes more and more dangerous in chapter one. The spirits um, are um, presented as phenomenon in itself. And uh, Dante writes, um, you're always with me uh, and to be with me is uh, courage in itself and love is so um, noble oh, well and um, I can never imagine you without that in chapter seven the transformation ideas are presented very clearly so um, love is shown as a destructive force as well. And uh, we can um, actually trace the senses of characters of Dante in their transformation. So we try to uh, see it in that particular away uh, so uh, physical and moral capacities are given priority and in uh, this way from chapter one to chapter five we see the differences so uh, in later on uh, 
these stories of Francesca's love, her um, ability to um, manage her senses, her love, and um, it happens throughout her whole life. And in Vita Nova, as it is the case in Vita Nova, the dominance of love is um, oftentimes presented as a negative phenomenon because Francesca starts realizing her sins and uh, her adoration with love uh, is uh, very important. So in her very uh, sincere and a uh, strong, um, well, um, explanations. Uh, she mentions that uh, in well, uh, those who feel love and those who do not, well, um, are capable of um, either getting or losing their freedom and they are more prone to divine sentiments. In Vita Nova, those following um, uh, their feelings of love are shown in their naked uh, essence, like it is shown in chapters five and seven. And starting from chapter five onwards, the sensitive spirits of love are uh, becoming a central composition in a way. So uh, uh, this or another character is shown through the prism of love. In Vita Nova, chapter five, there is arrogance of love that is shown. And in grammatic, a manner, the concept is being revealed and uh, welcoming Beatrice, um, uh, which uh, was an unbelievable happiness for Dante. Um, so uh, this uh, happiness is uh, presented in Dante's verses and this feeling of happiness and adoration are um, actually uh, getting to uh, clemency and mercy. So the Trinity expression of them shows that love uh, for Dante's characters unites their um, bodies and their will. And as it is shown in chapter one, the sweetness of love is uh, prevailing. And the same dynamics uh, is true with Francesco. Francesca Paolo and Francesco are penning the book of love and reading that book of love. They try to protect themselves from negative intents, uh, they uh, are thinking of their physical beauty. And in chapter five of Vita Nova, we can see that the episode uh, in chapter seven uh, seems to be similar to that. But that is all shown um, in a way that when the um, heroes are confused, uh, when Beatrice denies the welcoming remark by Dante. Uh, so um, the expression of love leads to more tragic outcomes. And in the beginning of the chapter, um, the, there is transformation that is shown in, in chapters seven and nine, you know, that's how they express this. Uh, writing in this way about love is um, something that depletes the forces of any person. Therefore, uh, Beatrice continues 
writing and demands that from Dante, from chapter 10 onwards, Dante is speaking of tender love. And this uh, love is, or the dominance of love that could be fatal for him is something he is trying to get rid of. And some unexpected events start happening to him. Uh, so these um, general expressions um, actually are uh, more used in this case. So in um, chapter five, well, uh, depicting uh, Inferno, uh, Dante shows the selfishness of heroes, uh, the selfishness of Francesca that leads to her ultimate demise and, and, and defeat. And in section five, um, chapter five, uh, love becomes a paganic symbol. Uh, so in uh, Purgatoria, uh, chapter 24, we can see similar episodes um, that were expressed in Vita Nova in uh, the uh, presentation of love through the prism of Christian values and the allegory of love is clearly presented in this manner. Therefore, in chapter five, uh, Dante um, tries to define love, uh, something that we see in section 24 of Purg Purgatory. Uh, so um, uh, I would like to uh, read this. I told him, whenever I uh, am in danger, love is standing guarantor and guardian to me. And uh, this love uh, is carrying a huge meaning for me. So with that, Dante uh, tries to uh, actually follow the guidelines of divine forces and um, the uh, coming to Christian uh, values while well, um, the direct uh, connection to the Lord is very important uh, for him and uh, this is presented in a poetic manner. Therefore, um, we are not uh, moving far away from the literary meaning of Dante's words, um, stating that uh, love is a divine force. And um, in uh, chapter 16 of Vita Nova, uh, we also see the didactic elements of love, uh, which Dante is uh, very masterfully taking benefit of. And Dante, with his uh, lines, using this formula, tries to uh, express the way he understands love and he does it in a very clear and expressive manner. Therefore, in chapter 16, he adds the rhetoric function to love. And by doing that, he exposes, well, indicates that uh, by using poetic language, he's trying to explain this concept. Therefore, uh, Saint Thomas in biblical allegories uh, actually uh, is reflected in Dante's descriptions. Uh, so uh, as far as Beatrice is concerned, um, um, imagining paradise uh, through love uh, also gets this allegorical concept of love. And in the holy book, we uh, see that in the Bible um, and the way it is presented in Bible, we know it. 
coming to Beatrice, the love towards her is anthropomorphic. Uh, so there are no uh, false visions and biblical allegories in the real sense of the word are getting the reader involved and it has a huge pedagogical and didactic impact and uh, in divine comedy uh, Dante tries to use these allegories uh, the specificity of Vita Nova is that um, it has uh, a variety of functions, both didactic and pedagogical. And in uh, the sections related to Beatrice, uh, we uh, may conclude today that in Vita Nova, we um, uh, actually get this allegoric images, which are absolutely clear. And from this point of view, any comparison will uh, bring us to this conclusion once again. So with that, I would like to conclude. Thank you, Anna Rita Pacetta. Uh, you expressed in a very clear way the concepts of love and the manifestations of love in Dante's uh, uh, works <clears throat> and of course in our discussions we will continue that and get back to that point so now we will continue our presentations and the next speaker is Mr. Rafael Hussainov, the director of the Nizami National Literature Museum of Azerbaijan and Mr. Hussainov is going to speak of the real life and human being behind divine and historical layer of Nizami's Hamsa and Dante's uh, Divine Comedy. Distinguished call. Uh, that uh, I am the only person who lives and works in Nizami's museum. The person who was born uh, in 880 years ago in the museum that I had was uh, built 80 years ago. So the spirit of Nizami is always with me. He's next to me and one of his poems, Leila and Majnun, when he started the poem, he faced the havens and he said, uh, oh, uh, he wrote, oh, the name that is the start of everything. Not a single world of word of mine is going to be penned without your blessing. So for me, it is easier to start because I'm guided by two outstanding names, uh, Dante and Nizami, and the year of 2021 that is coming to the end. But um, in 1899, 120 years ago, Rudyard Kipling uh, wrote a pent a work that is called *In West*, and in that work, Rudyard Kipling. He said, East is East and West and West will never be together. They will never come together. 120 years passed by. And by the early 21st century, in 2021, 120 years after he wrote that, even though East is East and West and West, they have always been together. They have been always 
complementing on each other. And it's the mix of these two cultures. It's their ability to enrich um, uh, each other that made the world such a beautiful place to be. And one of the followers of Nizami, Mavlana Jamaladin Rumi, used to write in his Masnavis, Maslumi Gurum, um, uh, so he was writing that we came to accommodate each other. We are here to bring people together, not to divide them. And from point of view, uh, the legacy of uh, Dante Nizam is something I would like to draw, draw attention at. Even though it looks very um, abstract, you always feel the epic of any work. Uh, even though it's maybe hidden, however, uh, starting from language and style, all the way to some historic elements. They do recreate the historic context. And there are some enciphered codes by the writers that still reveal their respective time and make it possible for us to see the time period, the historic background behind every um, work. Uh, and it's far not by chance that a number of medieval researchers, well, uh, together with the researchers of later period, well, were trying to track the time and the context. And in Hamsa, this uh, collection of five poems, they could see the time of Nizami. They uh, could, uh, therefore, they considered Hamsa the mirror reflecting its time. The same holds true with um, Divine Comedy that is uh, presented by a number of researchers as an encyclopedia of medieval Europe, along with some specific features it is a great advantage of Nizami uh, for the Oriental culture and Dante predetermined Dante's role in the Renaissance in Europe. Uh, while uh, closeness to royal court politicized in a way their works. Uh, well, uh, in case of Nizami, there were a lot of court poets, which never happened to Nizami. And even sometimes when uh, they used to write uh, some of their verses and they praised their rulers of the day and made some eulogies to them, they still were able to convey their own message. And that is exactly what happens to Nizami. So this is one of the important problems of Hamsay, Nizami's Hamsay. They are the works that reflect his philosophical views and realistic approaches. Uh, so in Hamsay lines, the um, dedications to love, to the Almighty, uh, raises his elevation to the sky. And in the meantime, uh, he covers his time and period and he writes about ordinary people. And um, his uh, aspiration to create the just kingdom. And um, well, it's not only confined to the appeals or criticism towards the rulers. Well, he was writing uh, some universal messages to the rulers of both his time and the time afterwards. Therefore, some of his messages, or most of his messages, are valid to this day. And he was writing his um, advice to the rulers of both the day, of the rulers of today and tomorrow. The same thing can be traced in Dante's works. 
in his Inferno section, uh, he has some political motifs and uh, the tough attitude towards Dante by the rulers of the day, while even though it's shown as uh, making mortal Dante kind of mortal, mortar, uh, martyr. Uh, so um, it uh, really is, very, the message is very clear and uh, the political motivation was uh, sensible that resulted in Dante's persecution. Uh, if you can, if there are people who are comparing Dante's poetry with a beautiful Gothic church and uh, they um, outline uh, the divine comedy that is a mirror of its time in a way. So um, I would like to speak of something that brings together Dante and Nizami, because geniuses may live in various time periods and in various parts of the world, but by the essence, by their nature, they are pretty close to each other. And um, even though they uh, lived in different geographies and wrote in various languages, uh, they have commonalities in both their personal lives and of uh, their legacy. There are some striking intercultural commonalities in their works. Uh, Nizami is an oriental poet by his origin, but um, the universality of his messages makes him universal. From that point of view, Dante could be considered an Azeri poet because uh, his uh, actually values are applicable to all nations. Nizami Ganjavi and Dante Alighieri happened to address not only their respective nations, but something beyond their nations. So while studying uh, their legacy, we see a lot, a lot of commonalities. Comparative approach, ability to descend from the lowest levels to elevate to the highest ones. And uh, there are some very specific peculiarities of both is that they were writing for distant future and the ideal social model they were um, actually advocating um, was the message for future. They created the models and formula that are still applicable and it's far not by chance that both um, Nizamis and Dante's uh, legacies became models for uh, sources for ideas uh, and uh, a number of imitations that followed in the centuries to come. Uh, Nizami was living throughout the 12th century and passed away in early 13th century. And as we see from historic sources, he spent his most of life, most of his life in Ganja. He never traveled anywhere beyond Ganja, but his five poems uh, stretch from um, India. The responses to his poems were coming from as far as India, from 13th century all the way through the 20th century. Uh, the responses to Nizami were coming from all over the world, even though the person himself never left his hometown of Ganja. And um, so it means that it stirred a great interest. It, it, it enjoyed a great interest uh, in Europe. So that brought to the school of Nizami. The same holds true with Dante, particularly the history around his divine comedy. And the impact, like in case of Nizami, is not limited to the national level. It goes beyond the national boundaries and grow one of the global phenomena. And uh, 
while like in a Russian literature that may seem also different, but um, studying Russian or Azerbaijani literatures, we can see the impact of divine comedy, Dante's divine comedy. Russia, one of the uh, scholars who was seriously studying Dante Alighieri was Professor Danchenko. Uh, he said that Dante was never a chronicler or um, um, a silent observer of his respective time. No, he was a participant of the turbulent events of his lifetime. And uh, there were many responses to Dante coming from Russian literary traditions. And the way Russian literature benefited from that, very versatile and very multifaceted. In the end of 19th, early 20th century in Azerbaijan, we had a play, Saint Javid, whose trilogy was, um, the owl, um, the uh, devil, the iblis, and uh, actually uh, he seems to be a person of a different mentality, yet his poet reverberates with Dante's divine comedy. Speaking of similarities between Nizami and Dante, well, it's also the issue of years. Nizami penned his, uh, well, uh, for poems in Persian, which was the dominant language of the Orient. At that time, both ethnic Azeris and Kazakhs and Osman Turks and Afghans and Amikos of Pahlavi living in India, they all were using Persian. That was the common language of poetry that made um, that provided the grounds for dissemination of their uh, works in their lifetime. Therefore, shortly after Nizami's death, the response to his poetry came from as far as India. And while well, it was a good response, so question may arise, why didn't Nizami write in his mother tongue? Well, uh, Latin in Europe was something like English for the world today. And the same thing, Persian was the language of poetry and Arabic was the language of science. And um, Nizami indicates why he didn't write in Turkish. He said, I'm ethnic Turk. However, sorry, no, uh, in this I dark don't... environment, <laughs> Uh, uh, writing in Turkic will not provide me the reader's audience. audience. So I, my works will never be uh, disseminated that much. And Dante uh, decided to write in um, Italian. Uh, he could write in Latin, so he would get immediate popularity. However, the difference is that he started writing in Italian. And that paid off centuries after, but he was one of the founders of this literary Italian language. And therefore, uh, the comedy leaves on, as well as Hamseba and Nizami. And uh, it's one of the most popular works in Europe. And um, the impact of both Dante and Nizami uh, is sensible 700 years after Dante's death and or uh, 800 years after Nizami's death. And that shows that they succeeded in touching upon eternal values that made their works immortal, really. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Husina. This was very rich. I really made a common point between these two great geniuses and uh, their global meaning it was quite wonderful. Thank, thank, thank you very much very important information for all of us. So, but uh, we have to go on. And um, now I want to like to introduce the next speaker is um, uh, Dr. Michael Barry from uh, American University of, of uh, Afghanistan, USA, Italy. I don't know where it is situated, but, but, but uh, anyway, it's somewhere. 
And um, your theme is um, uh, the emperor and the widow, a story common to Nizami and Dante. So you are most welcome. my little exploration of some startling, absolutely amazing common points between the poetry of Dante and that of Nizami Ganjawi. So I hasten to assure everybody that with the destruction of our university in Kabul, we are trying to revive, and one of the places we have chosen is Venice. Venice so open, to all the world and which has hosted so many unhappy people fleeing persecution. Uh, allora mi sia concesso di fare la presentazione in inglese perché penso che sia la lingua la più comune fra tutti. So, Odila, uh, I will be asking you to go through these images, please, rather quickly since our time is limited. And so we start with the master of the most exalted rank. We start with the Sheikh Ali Maqam with Nizami. And if we see that the manuscripts of Nizami's works are so beautifully illuminated and illustrated, it was because his civilization truly considered him after his death, the Sheikh Ali Maqam the master of most exalted rank, and I'm thinking of Dante's Honorate l'Altissimo Poeta, honor the most high poet. So you have illuminations like this, paintings illustrating the stories of Leiliu Majnun as far southeast as India, as in this 18th century Indian example, or on the other side, you see here on your right, Khosro discovering Shirin bathing in the mountains. And I simply want to call your attention to the symbolism that the painter Sheikh Zada, disciple of Bezad, but working in Tabriz in the Iranian Azerbaijan, brought to this apparition of love to which Mrs. Pacello was calling our attention. The tree of life appears in all the multiplicity of its colors to shelter the holy person. I take these words from the great early 13th century Spanish Muslim mystic Ibn Arabi, who was much commented upon in 15th century Herat and Tabriz to mean that the tree of life recognizes the holy person who is a lady. Here is Nizami as painted by the great Bezad reminding us in late 15th century Herat that Mizami was taken seriously as a teacher. And when he addressed his poetry to his own son, this is an idea that Mizami derives from the Nicomachean ethics of Aristotle, that the poet should be a teacher and that we all become his pupils like the own son of Nizami Ganjawi. Next, Adela, please. Next, Adela. So here again is the idea of Nizami as a teacher. The two Herati painters, Qasim Ali and Bezad, represent Nizami himself as the school teacher in the school where Qais, future Majnun, under the wonderful tree of life, will write his first poem in love of Leili, who has just been revealed to him. And she sits underneath a mihrab in this school, which is also set in a mosque, because she is the focus of his contemplation, very much like Beatrice for Dante. And we are in the world of common courtly love. Next. Next, please, Odila. Yes, this is again, okay. This is again Leili represented 
by the master Muhammadi of Herat, some 100 years after this painting, but which he contemplated and meditated upon. And we see Leili as queen of heaven, a true Beatrice. She is set within her mehrab. Here she wore red, like the red princess of the Haftaikar. And here she wears a royal crown and the Narcissi in her hands called Abharul Ashikin in scholastic Arabic, the Narcissus of the lovers, means these are the eyes of all her male lovers through which she looks at herself. Indeed, she's a personification of the divine, and the eyes of the world are the eyes through which the divine looks upon the divine. So this is a very profound mystical meditation with the idea that Beatrice and Levi have so much in common in inspiring the poet who will become mad for love of her. Next. Next, Odila, please. Yes, so here is a detail of Nizami himself as the schoolmaster, and this very much corresponds to the image which became crystallized in Eastern Islamic art after the 15th century of Nizami as, in fact, himself a personification of the active intellect, the angel who conveys to us higher truths in the appearance of a wise old man as described by, as the Italians would pronounce it, Avicenna, meaning the great philosopher Ibn Sina of the 11th century of the Common Era. Next. Next, please. Yes, the detail of Nizami's face as imagined, a meaning endowed with all the majesty, but none of the weakness of old age. Next. Here again um, by Bezad, the great mosque of Herat, and the character here, we'll look for the detail next, please. Next, next, again, that was Bezad himself. Next, next, please. Yes, come, come, come lower. Yes, here again is this character that we could call the Sheikh of initiation. He is the or intellectus agens, the agent intellect, the thought of God initiating us into higher wisdom associated with Nizami by the late 15th century in Herat, called by Jami and the other writers of Herat as absolutely the Sheikh Ali Maqam. Next image. And this is underlined by an extraordinary painting from 1486, illustrating the Turkic language works of the prime minister of Herat, Mir Ali Sheri Nawai, who here dreams that he has been guided into paradise by his own mentor, who is Jami, who is the, the true spiritual master of the kingdom of Herat. It is a relation very much like Virgil with Dante. In other words, Jami is introducing Mirali Sher Nawai, who hides his hands out of respect in front of the great Nizami, here perceived again as the absolute center of all past poetry, as in Dante's Limbo, where Virgil introduces Dante to the great poets of the pagan past, with Homer in the center, Honorate l'altissimo poeta. Here we can say that the Sheikh Ali Maqam, the Lord of the most exalted rank, who shows talatuf, who shows grace to this new poet who writes in Turkic when all the others were writing in Persian, much like Homer with Virgil guiding greets Dante as a new member in a new language among the great Greek and Latin poets of the past. And there is no doubt that we are in paradise since even the moon here 
points downwards in reverence for Nizami, which of course no moon looks like in a real sky. Very quickly to go through the poets, here is Amir Khosro of Delhi, closest to Nizami, then Ferdowsi, Saadi, Sanai, Anwari, Khokoni, and standing humbly, Hassani Dehlawi, Hassan of Delhi. Next. Next, please. So here again is a close up by the painter Qasim Ali of Nizami as the active intellect, as the supreme teacher. Next. Next, please, Adela. And this is a recreation of this archetype by Muhammad Ali of Golconda in early 17th century India, which reveals how the Indians had received this archetype of Nizami representation into their own very Persianized culture. And we can identify this wonderful poet now in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts as Nizami himself, the Ayinaya Raib, the mirror of the unseen world. Next. Next, please. So very important in these Indian representations of Nizami is the idea that Nizami is a teacher poet who does not really depend on the favor of kings. Instead, kings search for his favor. So Nizami here is shown in this 1595 manuscript copied for Emperor Akbar. He's shown presenting his Khamsa to the Shirwan Shah, who is the Azerbaijani ruler, but represented much younger than Nizami, as if the ruler himself becomes a pupil to Nizami, the teacher. Next, Odila. Uh, this idea, which is very important in this early mid 16th century illustration to Jami's poetry, shows the idea that the poet is instructed by the angels if he is truly inspired, like Saadi or Nizami or Jami, and a disciple looks one night through a chink in the doors and discovers where the inspiration of the poet truly comes from. Next. I'm going to go through, I have to ask you to go next because these are meditations on why Bezad was chosen to illustrate Nizami, but we'll go on. Please go to the next ones. I want to come to, yes, please, this idea that thanks to the example of Bezad in Herat, the illustrators to Nizami, like Daulat, the Indian painter here in 1607, 1608, is painting illustrations to the text of Nizami, which has just been copied by Abdur Rahim Ambarin Kalam, the scribe. So inviting us to consider the poetry of Nizami, not only through the literary analysis, but through the visual comments brought by the artists of the civilization. And I will go into this regarding Dante as well. Next, please. So this is one of the, the beautiful illuminations in Akbar's manuscript of the Khamsa, introducing the Mahzan al Asrar or treasury of secrets. Next, it's called the Shamsa, the sunburst. And this will be from the Khamsa, which will be the focus, the main focus of this talk. So there's the famous story here painted by Bezad of the Khalifa in the bathhouse who will be instructed into higher wisdom by the humblest person in the bathhouse, his bathhouse attendant. And this is a very strong theme which runs through all of Nizami that the higher the king, the more he has to learn from the humblest, poorest, person in the kingdom. And I just go very quickly through these images to point out the remarkable afterlife of this painting. When we see the wonderful abstract patterns of the decoration, next. Continue, continue. It even inspired Matisse. 
Now, we'll go through this image. Here's an Indian illustration, again, to Nizami's Mahzan ul Asrar. Take the next one, uh, Adela. Take the next one and the next one, because now we're going to enter into the heart of the discussion. So here is a theme of the Mahzan ul Asrar, here beautifully illustrated by Mir Mosawer in Tabriz, Tabriz in early 16th century Azerbaijani, well, Iranian Azerbaijan today. And the idea is the book is an instruction for kings. And here the king, Khosro, the Sasanian ruler, who was ruling when Muhammad was born, wonders what the owls are saying in the ruins. And the minister, Bozorgmer, explains to the king, the owls are congratulating you, O king, because you have so misruled the kingdom. You have extracted so many unjust taxes that the people are ruined and they are all fleeing to India and other countries. And so we owls have lots of ruined places in which we can nest. And the king understands the lesson and then rules with justice. I'm going to insist on this parable. We find it in many places in Islamic literature. Uh, the earliest place I've been able to find it is in the works of al-Mas'udi, who wrote in 10th century Baghdad. It's a Sasanian story, and it reminds us that for the scholars of Nizami's time, the Sasanian Persian Empire was not a kafir or infidel empire. Instead, it was an empire that was brought together by God for God's purposes in order to unite humanity and that Muhammad should be born when Khosro was king between the Euphrates and the Indus. It's an idea which we see the Islamic scholars especially the converted Iranian scribes of Abbasi Baghdad, very much borrowing, I think, from what the Christians had done after the Christianization of the Roman Empire, when the Christians began retroactively justifying the Roman Empire, because as Dante says in De Bonarchia, it was God's will that Christ should be born under Emperor Augustus, who had just unified the world in order to prepare humanity for the coming of the Christian message. The secularization of the Roman Empire in medieval Christian civilization, and very well summarized by Dante in De Monarchia, and the retroactive Islamization of the Persian Empire that we see, for example, in the poetry of Nizami, are remarkable cultural parallels. Next, please. Next, please. Next, please. Okay, next, please. So here I come to the main story, and I'll have to go very quickly. Next, please, Adela. Give me just two minutes, please. Here is the story of Dostani Pirizan Bar Sultani Sanjar, Pirzanero, Setamedar Gereft, Das Zado, Domani Sanjar Gereft, meaning a poor woman had faced oppression and she seizes the bridle of the horse of Sultan Sanjar, who is the greatest emperor of his 12th century day, begging for justice. And the emperor says, I have no time, I have to keep on moving. And the old woman who is the poorest person in the kingdom tells the king, if you do not give me justice, you are not worthy to rule and the king listens. And it's actually a portrait of the ruler of Herat himself, in this case, Sultan Hussein Mirza Baikara, and we're reminded of what so beautifully put it, the poet Horace, mutatis nominibus de te fabula narrator. Just change the names of thee the tale is told. So we just go through the images and you will see the remarkable convergence wonderful representation of the same story by Sultan Muhammad in Tabriz with the tree of life and the bursting forth of the son of glory. Sultan. Sorry. That's just the Dante images. 
just come up real quickly. Only one, we have to continue. Okay. <laughs> just sorry. quickly, just sorry. one more, 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 one more. Dante, oh. <laughs> the widow in front of Emperor Trajan, another name for the same idea in front of the Palazzo Ducale in Venice to remind all the senators and the doge himself that justice must be granted to the poorest person in the kingdom, as we see in so many illustrations of Dante. The origin of the story I finally found in Greek, just keep on going, the story is finally found in Greek, and it was something that actually happened with Emperor Hadrian in a hurry, stopped by a poor woman and forced to grant her justice. And this was transposed from these ancient well, images. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Thank, thank you very much. much. Uh, sorry, sorry, we, we could continue forever. That is so fascinating. You are a very rich presentation. Absolutely wonderful. I, I thank you very much. That there is another lady, lady Magnum, this opera, which I saw once in Baku Theater, is based on Mizami as well. So it's fantastic, really. Thank you so much. And then we have to continue immediately because uh, time is running so fast. And uh, we go to the um, last speaker of our session, who is uh, Rahila Ibulayeva, our, our uh, close uh, colleague. And we thank you very much for organizing uh, uh, this, this important meeting and inviting uh, people here. And uh, you are from Baku Slavic University, of course. And uh, your theme is the medieval concept of emanation and semiotic parallels on an example for the works of Nizami and Dante. And uh, you speak in Azeri or in English. Okay now? Yes. Is now. it okay now? Uh, yes. Do okay. you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yes sure. And uh, what is emanation? Uh, we can uh, see various uh, approaches to this. And one of the representation of idea, uh, reaching the source, reaching the coil of life to be enlightened, to be uh, enlightened means to be equal to, uh, no, to be knowledgeable to wisdom. And one of them is uh, represented in literature, as well as in religious beliefs and philosophy. Uh, it is in literature, in symbols and hagiography. And emanation, first of all, briefly, uh, what is uh, approved to understand uh, mainly, it is something which originates of, uh, or issues from a source. And one of the important points is of understanding the emanation idea. Uh, that is uh, evolution which goes from less to more perfect, while emanation also uh, approved, like I said, is of descending stage. So it is something it, uh, unchangeable. And uh, I put here some parallels, semiotic parallels of uh, emanation uh, before and after medievality to understand to great thinkers, uh, to rethink emanation. It is uh, God's uh, manifestation to, fall, uh, to flow from in symbol of wisdom and beauty in uh, uh, both for Dante and Nizami. Uh, the other point is horn. I decided to also touch this uh, visual element because in Nizamis uh, Iskandar Nama, Iskandar Zulkarnain, he is usually by myth and then by Nizami, he is two horned Alexander. And I, I am just highlighting main points. If then you have any questions, I will try to answer. We have one more parallel from Christianity, who is the horned Moses. If you remember in Michelangelo, he is depicted with two horns. And it was until 1601 before uh, St. Clement's translation of Vulgata, but before it was since fifth century for a thousand years, it was uh, based uh, this horn, the Moses were based on Jeronim's uh, translation of Vulgata because Jeronim also, because Jeronim tried to check it with original and in Hebrew, it was one of the meaning of the horn. So horn in the meaning, which is equal to be enlightened, uh, to be knowledgeable. One more uh, sacred person, but before Christian, 
Uh, before monotheistic uh, religions, we find in Odin. Odin is uh, with two, three horns, and he uh, it, it is also a drinking utensil for uh, Vikings. And it is based on the vibe. It is related with wisdom because Odin knows how to get this three horns, where is the mixed blood of Kwasir, the knowledgeable person, with honey. The one more uh, parallel for enlightened uh, emanation is also before monotheistic religion. It is from Hinduism, Matsya, the horned fish. And this is one of the 10 avatars of God Vishnu. And one more we can find in monotheism, which is the uh, shofar horn in Yom Kippur, the Hebrew New Year. And the other uh, emanation symbol is virgin and beauty in literature, in, in the literature case, the Shirin, Nushaba, Lili, seven beauties by Nizami and parallels by, uh, by the way, I never meet their parallel with Martinius Capellas because if you remember, this is from the fifth century, his um, um, marriage of Philologia to Mercury. And the liberal arts, general education in European, uh, in European, European universities, the Western universities are based on this liberal arts, which, which was highlighted by Martinus Capellas, uh, this um, tractat. And who is Philologia? Philologia, there is a symbol uh, of proto-image, we can tell, uh, of Shirin's uh, renders heroes, Shirin and Nushaba, because um, uh, Nizami is writing in his Hosrub uh, and Shirin that I got my knowledge from Hebrew, from uh, Nasrani and Pahlavi uh, manuscripts. So we can tell that he also was familiar with this Nasrani way, which is philologia. And philologia was a beautiful girl uh, who uh, passed uh, knowledge to uh, Mercury, which knowledge, and they became then part of uh, liberal arts general education. It is one of the points. Uh, so what is before Nizami? I am telling what is before Nizami and Dante medieval period. And one more it is also, which is represented by Dante's Imperium. It is uh, depicted in Hebrew um, understanding, which is uh, Ein Sof, infinite light, or Ohur Ein, nothing less, or infinity in Judaism. And uh, it is also some parallels in Sufism. Parallel we can find also in visuality, which is a uh, um, nymph in Christianity for saints, like. Um, um, in astronomy, we know that it is the circular barn uh, around sun or moon, and it is for sacred people and also related with light, which means enlightened, emanated. And now I am putting here some samples, just uh, making uh, visual for you. Uh, this is Matsya, how, how it is depicted. You, you see here the fish avatar, one of the 10 avatars of God Vishnu with his horn. Uh, we find uh, parallels with Matya in two ways. Matya, as the same like Moses, he saves uh, sacred scriptures, Vedas in Hinduism, as well as uh, Moses did it, scriptures. And uh, the second one is, uh, Matya is depicted with horn and uh, Moses is depicted uh, with horns. Then, um, Plus, we can find also Matya uh, horn um, physical why it was important when he saves first man Manu. It is the like a parallel image for Adam during the Great Deluge from Indian subcontinent. So it is the important um, one, and in depiction, it is at, at least it was translated like a luminous appearance. Again, it is related with, uh, with being uh, luminous. And Odin, I already told about it, uh, about Kwasir parallels. And we have one more, I am sorry, because uh, I think it is a little bit small, but I found uh, from uh, National Library of Israel in internet, the uh, Iskandar with two horns. Here, Iskandar is depicted with two horns and it is related to 18th, 18th century. And this is, by the way, Odin's, uh, Odin's image with uh, three uh, horns. And it is also, uh, as I told, it is also in cultural and, and social anthropology, both of Vikings and also the Caucasus drinking wine. And um, in case of Odin, it is blood. But uh, we know that in Christianity, blood also symbolizes Jesus' um, uh, blood. So it is a mix of blood and honey. So, and all of three uh, horns have this one. And in the symbolism, it looks like this. And one more, linguistically and religious framed parallels we can find again 
it is how uh, Gustav uh, uh, illustrated the uh, uh, Imperium by Dante. It is parallel to ascension like mirage because it is beyond the physical being. And of course, it is after purgatory level. Purgatory, it is called by Dante, but um, so uh, following the uh, moral rules, you can reach something very high. It is in Christian, uh, in, it is in Muslim uh, rules. And one more parallel uh, of the uh, Ein Sof, uh, I can come briefly to, to it. Uh, Ein Sof is the emanator for 10 sephiroth. If you remember how it looks like, in uh, Dante's case, but the ten sephiroth it's also from Judaism. Um, the, uh, it is Kabbalistic tree of life. Sephiroth, other name is uh, Kabbalistic tree of life. And as a name, uh, Ayin, Ayin Sof, we never use it for Sufism, but we have in Azerbaijani and Turkic languages many related words with this, for example, Ayan Oldu, Einek, Eini, and it comes also from the Sumerian, Akkadian words, and then it is, they are depicted in Semitic languages like Hebrew, Arabic, which means the same, uh, and uh, the, uh, the other meaning in semiosphere, how Inna Mirkulova highlighted in semiosphere of a lot more we can find also not the same also the endless so infinite uh, light in cognitive linguistic so we can add one more line which is in hebrew soft soft mid which means at last uh, and one more also uh, as, uh, it is from the name sof hagia sophia you know and from greek it is in latin and roman languages like wisdom the root uh, so this is which we can tell uh, within framework of uh, linguistics the purgatory is here and the other one is in from Politrich of Jeronim Bosch. Uh, and now which is in medievality. We talked about what is at the same time like medievality and visuality, but all of based on translation of uh, religious sacred texts and uh, previous um, uh, myth which were framed in religious text and what was in different uh, areas apart from monotheistic regions. And now we can tell what was before it, uh, what uh, how, how they shaped during uh, Dante and Nizami. There is one one nice word in Russian, blago. It is possible to translate like happiness, nobility, uh, but. Blago means, I think, something more. I think the uh, question of what is the coil of life, the meaning of life is most related to be Blago. Blago means when, when you, uh, you are doing the best, but never hurting others. And if you want to be never hurt uh, others, it is not the simple question how we understand because uh, to happiness, to reach happiness is sometimes in some countries' uh, constitution. Uh, or a state constitution, for example, like in American constitution. So uh, to be happy is the right of everyone. But what is the, um, the happiness? Uh, before happy, uh, before uh, uh, happiness is to be, uh, to be noble. And one of the main things for being blago, for being noble, uh, for reaching this one, as we told beforehand, it was a woman. And of course, love, it is related with woman. Now for Dante, Beatrice is the guide to paradise in social and anthropology and etiquette. Uh, I am usually giving to my students trauma in conflict between individual desire and social frames. Uh, so, and then to rethinking how, for example, Dante or Nizami uh, rendered this uh, realistic love, realistic motive, like uh, wise people in their uh, text. Because you know that uh, um, Dante never married Beatrice because she already was married. But he reached uh, her wisdom only uh, after afterlife of Beatrice. In case of Nizami, it is mostly based on real love, his real life, and he's a, she is a guide to ethical life. In this case, we can follow uh, Freud when he uh, learns. Uh, he suggests uh, learns um, Shakespeare Hamlet's case why he uh, killed uh, and. We can use this psychoanalysis of fall in love with someone's image because, as you remember, uh, Shirin loved uh, Khosrov through the, his picture image. The same was was Khosrov, and in uh, love, love sickness, and love melancholy. In this diagnostic, um, which comes to the medical history uh, most uh, strong in strong way in 1943. 
learning this uh, love sickness uh, based on medieval text, uh, literary text, and based on Shirin, we can teach our students, for example, um, psychoanalytical fall, because first, uh, first stage of love melancholy, melancholy is when you uh, love someone's image, which is not the real person, not his real features. So Shirin loves him, but not Farhad. Even Farhad is more higher people by morality, but Shirin chose because she loved only the image, uh, but not Farhad who cuts down the rock to bring the milk river to Shirin's castle, committed suicide for the sake of uh, Shirin when he was deceived that uh, Shirin death. Uh, just uh, let me just make a remark why I think that it is important to keep this both real and profound life, uh, knowing this psychoanalytic or medical history side, because it, during this, by the, by the way, only during this um, research, it came to my mind uh, from our student period, we were all young and everyone was falling in love. I remember one of the boys and just at this time, rereading, rethinking Farhad, I found parallels between Farhad and this, our student friend who killed the beloved uh, lady. And he was a very, you know, polite guy and how he did it. So it is again, the case of Fred, how to uh, analyze uh, when the person at young age can kill someone being crazy, made or insane. By the way, it is also the point for, I think, our translators, in which case Farhad is crazy, mad or insane, or Majnun is crazy, mad or insane, because insane is in Azerbaijani, Ruhi Hasta, which is the spiritual illness and made crazy, some maybe mostly related to the ranking person. And in this way, another kind of uh, beauty image who transforms, enlighten the um, a person, in this case of man, he's not the ruler, he's the normal person, Majnun, the image of Leili, uh, which also goes back to Lilith from the apocrypha image, and who is totally different and uh, to Virgin Leili, and she is, according to apocrypha, one of, um, uh, to tell in uh, modern day terms, that she's like kind of prostitute. But she, she totally changed uh, Lilith image, uh, making virgin and making her devoted, totally different image. It is uh, totally in terms of Nizami's um, uh, emanation, Nizami's uh, educational uh, principles. But Lilith is also, but Lilith at the same time, not only Huri, not only heavenly person, it is something for, for real love. And we can also take this text, if you want to explain to our students, like a part of general education, like philology to, uh, teach to Mercury in Martin Campelis, uh, how to keep, uh, to, how to treat uh, uh, love melancholy stage. So there is always in social anthropology and etiquettes and between love, trauma and conflict of individual desire and social frames. One of the topics which comes from our this uh, conference. So love between happiness and the idea of God. I am, will not tell here more about philosophy, but in philosophy we can find many ideas about nobility, Blago from Platon to, uh, to Aristotle uh, to Socrates. And emanation now I am uh, concluding uh, in this text, in our research we submitted Ayn Sof and Sufi poetry and um, enlightened Shirin through beauty, Leili through beauty, and uh, in case of Sultan and Iskandar, they are not from uh, beauty, but from uh, women. And in this case, nobility for Nizami is not only being beautiful, being from Yevgenika, as I uh, told yesterday about it. Just if you, are, you can be old, you can be slave, uh, concubine, but uh, what is your feelings and inside uh, features? And also just resembling you that we told about um, Odin with three horns, Matsya horned fish and emanation in Christianity, which is brilliantly de uh, depicted by Dante in Christians again by Michelangelo, the best one. So he did his sculpture before uh, Saint Clemente's translation in 17th century and also in Hinduism Kabbalah. So I am very happy to find semiotic parallels between various religions, frame it, unframe it, approved, non-approved, uh, monothe monotheistic, pagan, but to find many parallels to uh, understand that people always have the 
same uh, feelings, the same um, many parallels, not the same, but uh, many uh, close uh, depiction of uh, things. And let me just tell, uh, we are uh, doing our conferences to talk about our problems, we tra uh, which troubles we have in our society. Uh, and it is good that we talk about love, love, because not only to women, to men, um, I think to all everyone who is around us, to human being, it is one of the prisons. So to teach love, then to help our students to manage their feelings between trauma and social etiquette. The other one could be um, how symbols have an impact to alphabet and Phoenician alphabet can be a nice symbol. And it was possible to put also par Pardesh, Paradise, uh, parallels between Hebrew Pardesh, Muslim, uh, Muslim Parda, but it, it is a topic for another conference. I, will, I think we will uh, continue it with our semiotic conferences. And, but it is for reaching something, the choir, for visual image, uh, creating semiosphere for translation studies and the learning psychoanalytics. Uh, and then at the end, I can tell, uh, it is not my opinion. I came to this opinion, but I made the same, which was told before me. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't know the author, but I am totally agree with him when uh, he told that. Having studied materials of Sufism for almost 30 years, I realized that in reality, in Sufi literature is behind mysticism. See, uh, all profile life, everything is based from humans. And Dante, both Dante and Nizami, they were real people. They came through these feelings, and but uh, like wise people, uh, because of their age, uh, they depicted what we should learn, what we must learn, I think, nowadays. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Celaya, for this absolutely excellent presentation with this idea of emanation of uh, kind of, kind of transcend, transcendence, which is uh, transdescendance, something emanation uh, coming coming down. So it was fascinating, and all your all your um, philological and uh, and cultural details, uh, which were very very convincing indeed in this this case. So thank you a thousand times, and also for your organizing work for this. Wonderful meeting. Uh, now the organizer told me that we should really finish without any discussion. I'm very sorry because I'm sure that these speeches have evoked many interesting ideas in your minds. So maybe uh, ten minutes because, as I said, the next uh, should start at 12:20, 12:20, and we have maybe seven minutes and five minutes for breaks. If someone wants to stay for discussions, what do you think about it? Just suggestion. You are the chair, so you can decide yourself. Uh, well, I, I, I had message from the organizers that, that no, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I think I have to follow the orders of the, of, of the Congress because if you must have a coffee break, they, they told me some, some kind of break, but um, well, it's, it's always in these important meetings that you have so many ideas that you can't just react immediately. But, but I hope there might be another opportunity uh, for, for discussion. And, and as Rahila Taylor told that we can continue this theme. I mean, it's in some other semiotic Congress, there are big events coming uh, soon at the uh, World Congress of Semiotics and many, many others, so that you might have this opportunity. Well, I, I thank once again for all of you. It was really, uh, it's very, very uh, big revelations um, Revelation, uh, I would say, of, of the, these two great poets, Nizami and Dante, and, and I wish you a really great continuation of this symposium. So thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll be in touch soon. Yes. Okay. Sure. Okay. I'm so sorry if I have some mistakes in uh, uh, justifying times, time zones. I am so sorry about it. Okay.